<laughs> All right, everyone. So we'll get started here at 1004. And I will begin by welcoming you all to the new Dutchess County Historical Society campus, but I want to invite Bill and Melody to give some commentary. I'm sorry for those of you who couldn't join us in person, because this is quite the visual feast, as you might see from the camera coverage around us. But Bill and Melody, do you want to provide any welcoming remarks? Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'll just say, uh, we're happy to be hosting here. We don't technically have our full certificate of occupancy, so we're operating under a temporary one. That's why you haven't seen a lot of noise about a big grand opening uh, to the public. So we're still, there are some technical things that aren't really related to us, but the whole site. And the, sometimes these things go slowly. And uh, But otherwise, we're open. Uh, on a regular basis for our volunteers and our members and our friends. So we're operating in this kind of way uh, and happy to be starting to have a lot of people come in just off the street and uh, meet new people and welcome our old friends too. So we're thrilled to be able to start to you actually use this place. Yeah, and it is a beautiful campus. I hope everyone takes advantage of the opportunity once open hours are established to check out the collections and um, mm -hmm. enjoy everything that Rhinebeck has to offer. So, so since maybe it's an appropriate time because Nancy's here to point out that over to the, on the north side wall is the Arthur and Nancy Pell Library, which Nancy's been working hard to set up and establish and brought up the the things we're very pleased to have here. So we'll introduce you all to that library when the meeting breaks up. So thanks again. And actually, since we have so many friends with us today and a few new friends, I think it's probably good for us to go a quick whip around to introduce ourselves. We can start with Nancy Kelly, our town and Ryan Beck this morning. Oh. Yeah. And um, Arthur and I were um, publishing kinship books for many years and displaying them at book sales all around the country, and at the same time, picking up books. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a very large collection, and we're glad to share it with everyone and hope that they can come to do research. Excellent. This is my daughter, Claire. Oh, she she um, <laughs> is a retired historian from the county of Montgomery, and. And Maryland. Oh. Now oh. back north, so I'm now in the area. We're still doing research. Okay. Great. Mike Peach, you're next. Uh, Mike Peach, I'm uh, okay. chairman of the 150th New York uh, Historical Association, and I've been uh, working on creating some Civil War content for the historical design. Rick Sodler, I'm the uh, Town of East Fishfield historian, also the site director for the Frigerhoff House Historic Site in Hopewell Junction. Vicki Labruto, Milan historian. Steve Lynch, I was the uh, former uh, president of the Fishfield Historical Society for 13 years, and I resigned as of uh, July 1st. All right. I had to put resign. Sorry. Anyway, uh, we're, we're with the Fishko, uh, the uh, Van White Homestead Museum in Fishko. Alexis Lynch, treasurer for the Fishko Historical Society. Georgia. Georgia Herring, uh, LaGrange historian. Mm -hmm. Mike Frazier, the LaGrange Bank historian. Uh, Peter Bunsen, a Mid Hudson Anti Slavery History Project. You know me, executive director of the <laughs> 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 And Claudia Close, head of collections for Historic Red Hook. Melody Moore, Dutchess County Historical Society. Well, Tatum, you're Dutchess County historian, and we have two new friends today. Brian Reed, I live in Red Hook, retired teacher, and I'm the unofficial historian for the Hudson River Race Yacht Club. So, in a lot of regions, the origins of ice building in the Hudson Valley. And I'm uh, Bob Wills, a Rhinecliff resident, and uh, Former Commodore of the Hudson River Ice Yacht Club and now president of our new organization, the Hudson River Ice Yacht Preservation Trust. 
We're uh, all of us sailors are getting old. There's less and less ice to sail on. Mm -hmm. So I figured we should do something to preserve these uh, these artifacts from the 1800s that awesome. we keep restored and uh, in in good shape and running shape. So. And I retired from Dutchess County. You might remember me. I was the Geographic Information Systems Coordinator for Planning and the Health Departments. And I'm the one that um, did the yeah, store yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mapping application. <laughs> so thank you. Or, and those of us, or those of you joining us online, please feel free to unmute and say hello. Hello, Beth Devine from the Wappingers Historical Society. Mm -hmm. Barbara Sweet from uh, both Hyde Park Historical Society, Rhinebeck Historical Society we're members of, and also Clinton Historical Society. I'm Karen Lambden, a trustee for Dutchess County Historical. Um, uh, live in Dover, member of the Dover Historical Society. Nan and Nate Millbrook in town of Washington. In town of Washington, and Nan's my better half. <laughs> Jane Rossman, uh, town of Northeast, Millerton. Julian Strauss, a uh, member of the Amenia Historical Society, and my wife is here also, Betsy. <laughs> um, Years, I think you're the last. Valerie LaRobadier, Town of Dover historian and chair of the uh, Beekman Patent, uh, Beekman Precinct, Rev 250 meeting uh, work group. Kathy, did you introduce yourself and I missed it? So Kathy Spears, Stanford Historical Society and Stanford Town Historian. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us, both in person and virtually on this surprise snowy morning. I certainly did not see that in the forecast. So we'll now move to announcements. And the first, we go back to Commodore Wills to tell us some more about the Hudson River Ice Yacht Preservation Trust. All right. Well, uh, thanks, Will. And um, I don't know if we could bring up our website, but um, our IT guy has <laughs> left. <laughs> OK, well, in the meantime, it's H-R-I-Y-P-T dot org. It's a mouthful. Sorry, but uh, it is on the agenda. So they'll be able to. Oh, good. Good. OK. All right. Great. So you can uh, take a look at that. We're um, trying to um, show beautiful photographs of the of the old ice boats in use. Uh, we still sail these boats from the 1800s and, and anytime there's, uh, there's ice. Uh, last year, no ice at all, but previous two years, we've been up in Athens uh, and uh, had a couple weeks uh, both years of uh, some great sailing. So we do travel around a little bit, but we try staying close to the area. Uh, another place uh, we sail is uh, on Orange Lake by uh, Newburgh Stewart Airport area. That's always been a historic uh, hotbed of ice ice yachting as Poughkeepsie I was given, which is kind of the, the center of it all in the uh, 1870s. So, um, so the uh, the idea here is that we we start something so we could. Uh, preserve the ice yachts, eventually, hopefully having a museum of some kind, some way to display the boats as well as have a workshop where we can, uh, where our members can work on the boats and store them. A lot of our boats are under um, quite a bit of risk. Uh, they're out in people's yards and not really protected so well. So we don't, you know, we, we don't want to lose any more uh, than, uh, at all than that have already been lost. So, so that's 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 our objective. Uh, we've uh, I'm slowly learning about social media, and <laughs> which is uh, less than uh, uh, you know it's a, a slow process for 
somewhere at my, at my age. Uh, but um, so we have the website, we have an Instagram page, and the website links to Brian Reed's site, which is uh, there we go, oh, there you which go. is um, um, White Wings and Black Ice. It's uh, a blog that Brian has been running for 15 years now, remember? And, and uh, uh, Brian has done a lot of research at FDR Library and elsewhere, um, collecting information on our old uh, old boats, the old member logs from the 1800s, uh, and uh, is great at, at compiling all this. What's the address of the blog? Yeah, well, or what would I search for? If you search for White Wings Black Ice, you know, okay, or Hudson River Ice Yacht, either one. So, yeah, or or it, there's also a link from HRIYPT. Oh, okay, Brian's, because I'll put it in the chat. Okay, great. Yeah. So um, again, we're just starting. Uh, New York State uh, granted our provisional charter in October. In November, we, we received our 501c3 from the uh, uh, IRS, and mm -hmm. um, our trustees uh, right now we have we have five trustees. Uh, myself as president, uh, Richard Aldridge from uh, Rokeby is our uh, vice president. Um, our treasurer is Sam Phelan, who's chair of the Red Hook uh, Planning Board, and a longtime friend from my time as board member of Winnicky Land Trust, um, Robert Fennell Jr., uh, Bobby Fennell. Uh, the Fennells have been ice boating for years and years. Uh, the connection there is through the boats at, uh, at Rokeby. And uh, Dave Tobias. Dave Tobias is the head of real estate for the New York City watershed. So he is uh, an attorney and a real estate uh, uh, expert that hopefully can help us uh, in our future endeavors to establish a museum someday. We're kind of in this catch-22 spot right now where um, we, can, we can only raise money for boats that we own. We can't own boats until we have a New York State approved facility, you know, for fire prevention, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we are searching through ways of, of uh, uh, conducting business over, over the next year and establishing some priorities. We'll um, have uh, membership of some sort. The, the, the board hasn't figured that out yet, and hopefully a uh, capital campaign of some sort. It's been um, really heartening to uh, read about and hear about Bard's effort to buy the Unification Theological Seminary, because Tivoli Bay has always been our home ice when the Hudson doesn't freeze. Mm -hmm. And we, in the past, we've had a great relationship with UTS, which mm -hmm. they've allowed us to go down to the to, to have access to Tivoli Bay through their property. And uh, we hope that continues with BARD. We're also hoping that possibly the relationship could deepen there and we might be able to have some place to store boats and uh, show the boats to the public. So, so that's uh, where, where we're at with that. Brian and I lecture, we're happy to talk about ice boating to all of you, any of you, anyone you can think of, uh, just uh, email us or whatever. And um, the uh, Brian just spoke at the uh, Hyde Park Historical Society and uh, gave, gave a great lecture there on Archie Rogers, Archibald Rogers, neighbor of FDR and best friend of FDR and uh, the boats, the boats of Hyde Park. Um, we've, we've also had a relationship with the uh, National Park Service um, through Sarah Olson, another friend who uh, has asked us uh, to display ice boats in front of the FDR library. We've done that a number of years right in front of the library with nine boats set up between Christmas and New Year's. 
We've also interpreted and come up with a restoration plan for Hawk, FDR's boat that his mm -hmm. mother gave him in 1901 when he graduated from Harvard. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, 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 okay. Um, and uh, uh, this year we they've asked us to display boats, so we're going to display two Roosevelt boats, Vixen, a boat that John Roosevelt, um, long story, but owned. <laughs> How we acquired it is a different, <laughs> a little different story. Uh, and Chris, another Roosevelt family boat that, that I, I care to take right. So the idea this year is that we will have them uh, installed in the Wallace Center assembly rooms from mm -hmm. December 20th to January 7th. And um, we will be uh, having some time there for lectures. The club will be docenting while, while the boats are on display. So and we will be publicizing that as, as uh, we finalize the details. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Does anyone have any questions? Do you anticipate uh, offering rides? We always give rides. Okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. We love giving rides. And it's so. thrilling. Oh, I, I'm <laughs> thinking about it. Absolutely. It's, it's really <laughs> can you give, can, can we get his uh, email again? Sorry, can you repeat the question online? Is there, can he give his email again? The yes. email address. Yes. Um, my email uh, is director at hriypt.org. H-R-Y? H-R-I-Y-P-T. Put that in the chat. Dot org. Could someone put that into the chat? Right. We can. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. I'd love to. We've, we've done that before, actually. I uh, forget. It, it could have been Vassar, but it was down at Morse site. So years yeah, ago. Yeah, probably yeah. that would be the next. Um, there's also a link to the email and a contact page on the website. So, so it's not all, but uh, that was the first <laughs> article. It could be so much longer. <laughs> Any other questions for Bob and Brian? Thank you both very much for joining us. Thank Please feel free to stay. But if you have love to. No, 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 no. So our next our next item on the agenda, Denise Burns could not join us in person, but she wanted me to let you all know that this is the 225th anniversary of the Crumb Elbow Meeting House, mm -hmm. the actual structure that stands there today, and that they are having a special Leaps Across America event on December 16th, I believe it's a Saturday. So if anyone wants to participate in that, it is open to the public. Our next item, happily, Mr. Sodler was able to join us today despite the immense snow drifts. <laughs> Yeah, just, just getting here. Getting here was, was horrible. So do you want to tell us about this interesting inquiry from Mara CLS? Yeah, I will I will tell you as much as I know, and I'm actually I'm actually gonna read the information from the email that I received. So one of one of our trustees uh wives approached me about um about the Center for uh, Maris Center for Lifetime Studies, mm -hmm. and they are looking to um, probably in the fall of 2024. They're they're interested in having various historical societies come and give presentations. Uh, and I will just read. I'll read from what she sent me here. So it would be an introduction to the various historical societies of Dutchess County, their histories, sites, availability for visits, and anything else you think would be of interest. 
sometimes one lecturer speaks for all eight sessions, but often we have each session done by another lecturer. Um, that, that is what I am thinking about now, Judith writes to me. Of course, if there is one person who knows all of the information about <laughs> all, that would be okay. But often it is not done that way. We would have one person, either a county historian person, who could host each session and introduce the speaker, or we could assign a class manager to do that. So these, the courses that they hold, they're all held at Locust Grove. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if how many have been to any of these. I was unfamiliar with this until um, Judith Elkin approached me about it. Um, I think this would be a really great opportunity to um, to get new people involved in our historical societies um, as volunteers or members. Um, and anyone who's interested, I can I could just send all of this this information in an email to everyone uh, to make it uh, to make it easier that way. But I. Um, I, I think this would just be a really wonderful opportunity to introduce all of us to, um, you know, folks that live in the county or folks that live outside the county. Okay, great. so questions for Ray? It's a great, it's a great program. We can do it. We should. Yeah. yeah. So who's going to volunteer to talk about their historical society? Uh, Barbara Bar has her hand raised. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara Sweet, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I am a member of CLS uh, about 20 years. Um, and right now, um, I'm co-chairman of the Social Science Committee. And uh, something like this would be probably under our committee. We have a science committee, social science, arts and literature, and then life and leisure which is anything other than the other three so we have four different committees and each of us uh, each committee plans eight different uh, classes for the following semester so we have um, we're now working on fall uh, what what we're going to do next fall of 2024 but back in um, the fall of 2020 that was when COVID hit, okay, and we did everything on Zoom. So I put together a course, and I had uh, several speakers. It was titled Dutchess County Local History, and I had um, the town of Amenia was uh, one speaker. Another week, we had the town of Clinton. Another week, we had uh, Brad Kendall, uh, from the Dutchess County uh, office, um, and he was talking about the um, archival work he's doing. Then we had um, the history of the Bardavan, had the uh, Chris Silva came and told us the history of the Bardavan. We had the town of Hyde Park by that historian. Um, we had the village and the town of Rhinebeck done uh, by two different speakers from Rhinebeck, the town of Wappinger and Southern Dutchess County. And then we did the history of the sports museum in Dutchess County and the Dutchess County Sports Hall of Fame done by a younger person, but also the historian of uh, Wappinger. So uh, that was covered back fall 2020. Um, if you CLS um, is up to approximately almost 500 members now. Um, we're still looking for new members. And when we hit 500, probably waiting list is going to start. Uh, so it's uh, you pay one year uh, membership, okay? And the, the end of the year is uh, June 30th. So um, we have classes all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday at Locust Grove. Now what we're trying to do is also on Thursdays do uh, Zoom uh, classes. So um, that's what we 
do. And I, I covered uh, history uh, back in 2020. Thoughts, comments, questions? It's, it's a great program. Uh, I'll be doing a, a session this spring uh, with the CLS. And uh, it's, it's, it's a shorter, it's four weeks. Uh, it's similar to, but more condensed than what we did uh, and Bill was involved. Uh, let's see, when was that, Bill? <laughs> anyway, it was, this was the, the Vassar program, a lifetime learning institute. So right. uh, they're, they're I've been a little with Margaret different. for a few years, it's fabulous. So uh, I'm sure we can get enough people interested in it, so. How long are the sessions? Each session is approximately an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so we go from like 9.15 to 10.30, 10.30 to 11. We have a break uh, where uh, coffee is served. Then um, 11 to 12.15, 12.15 to 1.15 is lunch. And there's no uh, no way to buy on on site. So you have to bring your lunch or go out for lunch. Then we go back to classes 115 to 230. And then the last class is 245 to four in the afternoon. And we go all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday, Locust Grove, two rooms on the first floor and two rooms downstairs. So we can accommodate approximately 150 and one in the biggest room down to maybe, oh, 30 in the smallest room. So there are various four different rooms that we can occupy and we have to rent the space. One, one of the see Kelly himself who did the, the town of village of Rhinebeck for the Maris CLS a couple of years ago. And one of the things that we were concerned about and we were very impressed about was that their technical people were able to were really quite skilled because mm -hmm. we were doing a lot of screen sharing, going back and forth, question and answer period, introductions, and some of it had been pre-recorded. Uh, and you know, you never know how it's gonna work out. Yeah. It worked out perfectly. Yeah, they have their own equipment and yeah. technical assistance. Yeah. The other thing to be aware of is that our Ella Lifelong Learning Institute, similar structure to what uh, Maris is doing, not quite as extensive, but they too are looking for people to do the same yes. thing. They actually had approached the Rhinebeck Historical Society about doing eight session program to start in spring. Summer. And they were not asking us to look at other people. And that was a bit much. So we turned them down, but I guess they're also still, and these are just like Maris, in-person programs, not Zoom programs. But I know that the quality of, I have more experience with the bar set up, but I know that all the LMI program just had a tremendous reputation. And the participants, most of them having more time available, generally are quite serious about programs and history seems to be a major, major interest area. And as Rick said, you know, one of the advantages of getting involved in doing presentations, that kind of program, uh, is that any organization doing that may well benefit from individuals who have time available who may want to volunteer and spend time in our organizations. I think most of us are in a position where we would very much welcome that. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yes. All right, well, thank you all. Great. Rick and Barbara, I'm going to push you two in touch to figure out the best way for interested parties to link in with CLS, if that works. Barbara? Uh, yes. I'll do my best to see what I can do. Uh, with Zoom, uh, one thing we found 
I'm taking advantage of Zoom uh, for the winter. We have three courses in January, three different talks. Um, social science does. Um, I think uh, arts and literature has some courses, as does um, life and leisure. Mine are three uh, talks coming from Ohio. There's a person in Ohio that I know, and he is head of the volunteers for a military museum in Columbus. Um, he is black, and so he's going to give a talk. First one is on African-American inventors and what happened to them back before civil rights, uh, how they went to work for a company and all they, any patents that they developed, their names were erased from the patents, and things like that. Then he's going to uh, talk about Native American code breakers. These were the people back in during World War II that uh, sent messages back and forth using their code. Nobody else knew the codes, of course, of the Native Americans. And um, they actually, they think, stopped the war uh, at least a year ahead of time, World War II. Then his third one is he's going to go over um, African-American astronauts, how they went from just working in the space shuttle, um, in the laboratory doing experiments, to uh, fixing things outside, to doing spacewalks, and manning the space shuttle. So those are the three uh, we have in the winter. Um, but if if you're not a member, join now by calling uh, Robin at Marist. Thank you very much for that. Um, Val Robinier, you were next because you submitted some items for announcements. Oh. Uh, okay, well, basically, I just wanted to let everyone know that our display uh, that the Scatacote First Nations made for a, a timeline for the Chicamaco, the history of the Chicamaco community, uh, we made that for the Pine Plains Bicentennial, and it's now on display at the Pine Plains Free Library. Uh, it's a dis it's a uh, one of those pop-up banner things like the uh, County Historical Society did for the World War II um, traveling displays. Uh, it's a traveling display. It'll be there probably over the winter. Uh, we're we're going to have something in the spring in Dover, and we'll probably take it then uh, for that. But it'll be on display there until over the winter, like I said. Um, it just basically, it just shows all the uh, documents, most of the documents that we used in constructing our talk on their history for that bicentennial. Um, what else was I going to, oh, we're going to resume meetings. We've sort of been on hiatus, but for the Rev 250, uh, uh, Beekman Precinct, we're going to resume meetings now. We had already done a considerable amount of work planning events, and I am aware that we're not being funded by the state, but I don't think we're going to be prevented uh, from, I mean, it's still okay to, to do events, right? Yes, and there's an update on funding, although it's not coming to the state. Okay, so yeah, so we're, we're, pretty excited about the different events that we've been planning. So we're going to forge ahead, money or no. Are there any other announcements from the floor? Hmm. I, I will, since Tommy Houston is not on, Village of Fishkill is celebrating its 125th anniversary uh, in 2024. And they have an event planned for everyone. I don't have the calendar with me that I know it's going to be a festival or one in January. Hmm. Okay. 
give you more information than that. They don't have to. Any other announcements from the floor? All right, hearing none. Please point out if someone's raising their hand there and I have it here. But hearing none, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Bill Jeffway to talk about the first of our upcoming nature and anniversary event cycles, which is next year in what, 24 days now? 25 days? That's right. That's right. We'll be in the in the in 2024 shortly. I've always talked to Will about the anniversary of Lafayette's visit, he came in September of 1824. I always thought that the question about how or if or why we would celebrate it is kind of a good prelude to the 250th anniversary of the revolution. I literally had some people say to me, why would we be interested in a dead white old man or something like that? I'm like, well, usually in history they're dead. <laughs> But so, okay, so it's a fair question. I let's take reframe the question as why is this relevant today? And so I first got involved when uh, this group has organized these historic markers, right? And I was involved with Will and the one in Poughkeepsie and less involved with the one at Bard College, but I found the Bard College one more provocative and interesting because it references uh, uh, Lafayette's uh, uh, strong abolitionist views and actions and his attitudes towards indigenous people as progressive. And the more I studied the guy, the more impressed I was that this was, there was something valid there. And so with a view to kind of figuring out what it is, what would, what would we talk about? What would be interesting about Lafayette? I put in the chat a link to a site where I've, I've kind of published thoughts on how we talk about Lafayette or why he would be of interest today. It's dchsny.org, right? Our homepage, and then slash Lafayette 200. It's one word, because I can't share my screen, but I'll, I can share it internally here. But the thing that struck me about him is that he was a man, not just of words, but of actions. So like he did stuff. When he believed something, he, his actions were his mouth and his money work. And for example, uh, he actually famously wrote to George Washington saying, I have a scheme to buy plantation uh, in the Caribbean and create a model for the abolition of slavery. Will you join me? And Washington turned him down. But he actually did go ahead to proceed to, uh, to, to try that experiment. When I look at how he played on the global stage, he kind of represents our Franco-American relationships. But that he was a man of great detail and thought, and there's no better example in the world than the Fishkill's Lafayette uh, as Bureau, because uh, he was a man who I think had big ideas, but connected very personally and individually with people. I've worked on this narrative with a bunch of different inputs. And I just want to talk to you a little bit of all this big moves and intimate gestures. Why Lafayette's approach to equality has meant in much to so many. I always have long beginnings. But when you look at the people in the audience in 1824, there were women who had hopes of aspiration and equality. There were Blacks free and enslaved but had hopes. There were white Protestants, working class people who would form the shortly form the mechanics movement, political movement that had hopes. And when you look at Lafayette as someone who in 1824, America had a little ways to go to get more people to have an equal seat at the table, right? Women waited till 1919 for a national vote. But one of the ways we can learn about Lafayette because he did both speak and act in this progressive way is to look at people in the audience. So that's what we do. For example, uh, we have to surmise who is in the audience. But one of the things that struck me was there was a black couple in the town of Washington who a couple of years after in 1827, year slavery was abolished, they named their son Lafayette Williams. Okay, so there is a free black couple. This time they name their son Lafayette Williams. He goes on to fight in the Civil War. He goes on to die in the Civil War. 
And to me, that's kind of a, there's a rich story in asking why did those black parents choose to control their son Lafayette Williams? And how interesting that he went on to give his life for the country. And I'm flipping through a few things just to remind myself what to talk about. But he basically, his stops here, uh, when he was going from New York City to Albany, he stopped at Pipsy, uh, at Statsburg, Claremont, Winston Manor, Catskill, and Hudson. And on the way down, he stopped at uh, Cena, Montgomery Place, both, which is interesting now that Bard has uh, Messina. And then he stopped uh, at the DeWitt's Fish Kill uh, on, the, on the way um, as well up here. And so, with, in, in all those instances, he moves into gestures. Calm a crowd that was calling for the head of Marie Antoinette. He kissed the hand of Marie Antoinette. Calm the crowd. She had got a few more days. <laughs> <laughs> Hayden is a black abolitionist who was a slave at the time. He watched Lafayette go by. He said, and this is Lewis Hayden, that the moment I realized that Lafayette was bowing in respect to me and it could be no one but me because there was no one around me was the day that I committed to abolition for the rest of my life. So a bow from Lafayette, a kiss on the hand, motivated people to do these things. And he knew it. And uh, so... I talk about how we can have great relationships with the established, right? And the order of Cincinnati and the great uh, uh, the great people involved in that. The great story outside of Claremont, black sheep of the family, Henry Beef and Livingston of right? the black sheep because he was a little had a little bit of a like women a bit too much and uh, caused a lot of problems in the military. So he wasn't invited to the big do at the Livingston Vermont event. So he rode out to the middle of the river and met Lafayette. And Lafayette had him into his boat and they embraced and they spoke. So like Lafayette even is even the black sheep of the establishment. This guy's willing to deal with. He traveled with some interesting people when he was uh, visiting uh, upstate. There were no Oneida press, and he was in, uh, I forget exactly where it was, it was like Oneida, Heartland. And he said to his host, where are the Oneida that helped us so much in the Revolutionary War? And they're like, oh, we forgot to invite him. So he insists that the Oneida get invited. And he has a private audience with them, which he doesn't usually do. And uh, there are a lot of instances where he went out of his way to show respect and recognition for indigenous people that uh, often didn't get shown. Other people that might have been in the audience did a lot of work coming to know Sally Gilson. She was an enslaved woman at Montgomery Place. She could have been a servant at that time. She was around, hard to believe she didn't intersect somehow. She was uh, enslaved at Montgomery Place at the time when Lafayette had joined. And so I think it gives us an opportunity to talk about local indigenous people, both black people, and, the, and even the white working class. Of course, in 1914, famously, uh, Pershing did not say his assistant did, but then it was associated with him. Lafayette, we are here, right? It became the rationale for why we were about to have such a huge costly war in World War I. Uh, we had, prior to that, the Lafayette Escadrille, right? This is why we went all rich. It's so excited because the people that wrote me were very, because they were living in France very well tied to the French cause there. And so Peter Chapman becomes the first American to die fighting for the Lafayette Escadrille. We get Lafayette, we are here, 1917. And then Lafayette Day is created by uh, Victor Chapman's stepmother of Rokey. There's a lot of interest in Lafayette of Rokey then and now with Wynne Aldrich. And uh, the in 1958, um, uh, Hamilton Fish III created the Order of uh, Lafayette, and they awarded it to people like um, Eisenhower. And in 
1918, the women assembled at Lafayette Square in Washington and said, well, guess what? Lafayette, we are here. We, we may not have the vote, we may not have the liberty that you so valiantly fought for, but we invoke your name to get that uh, particular uh, law passed. So their, Lafayette's name was being invoked by women in 1918, so into the 20th century, as an insistence on liberty and equality. So that's a pretty good track record for one of that. If you, if you want to read through that, a couple of things. One is I'm developing that into a little documentary, but there's a professor at Bard, Zahima Mubakir, who is looking at turning this into a play that would allow uh, indigenous people and local blacks to be uh, performers in a kind of play that looks at Lafayette through the mm -hmm. eyes. And we're working with Montgomery Place to uh, have some kind of elaborate effort that would involve either that performance or that performance in a documentary in September of next year. And it makes it huge. Mm -hmm. There is a, we had a meeting here the other day of the professor of um, art who was interested in recreating the music that was created for Lafayette. So there are a lot of different angles uh, we're talking about potentially having a class with Bard LLI. So I've been more involved with Bard LLI as a member and a teacher. So I know we seem to have a little bit of a bias for one or another. And we're looking at having potentially a class that looks through the eyes of the audience, uh, the diverse audience. So the question questions for Bill. I think Southern Baptists in particular ought to be interested in this. Well, um, the Fishkill Stork, we have Lafayette's test. Yeah. Just so you know, in 1824, when we came back, there was Bill City something for you to do. You went to the house, she was the granddaughter of John Evans. Yeah. John Evans. He's got to see her at that point in Fishkill. We had this test offload. Given to the Brinker Hawk family because in 17, October 1778, Lafayette got very, very sick in a uh, rainstorm, almost died in Fishkin. The Brinker Hawk uh -huh. family, the Washington Boilers, or the Washington Aston, stayed at their house the first two weeks, he almost died. And here, uh, I think it got this week in October 11, 1778. There's a uh, monument by the cemetery that's by the Brinker Hawk House, oh, yeah. it is uh, dedicated to the fact that he was. He was there in Fishkill and almost died. But to make a long story short, in 2013, the uh, Arden Beverly had died in 2011-2012 and the daughter was selling the house. It's now a bed and breakfast. It's 52 and 82. Uh, we like a house. Uh, and everything was sold off. But the donation, the Lafayette desk was donated to our Fishkill store for the site. It's on display at the very white conference meeting. I'm thinking this is 2024 is the 200th anniversary of society. We'll probably be doing some of the public service. Come see the uh, Lafayette desk. Mm, that's really good. Because yeah. yeah. so, I do think it fits in a big story about him. It's really nice. Yeah. Very important. Mm -hmm. about him saving that. We're lucky that someone who's going to donate it to us. The Lafayette is there. The Washington mother. At our homestead a number of times. The well, official model is that George Washington never stepped here unless he goes to the board. <laughs> That's great. Now, you have a great story. And I guess the only thing I'd say is we have a little bit of a balancing act because the American Friends of Lafayette, the national group, is recreating and we'll have some international visitors recreating on the exact dates that Lafayette was here. So on September 19th of 2024, in September, a couple of days later in Fishkill. Right. But I think a lot of the things we're doing at BAR, like the performances are not necessarily going to align to that. If so, but we want to do something that aligns to the national effort with the Friends of Lafayette, but not everything is going to be falling out of it. I think uh, the story, uh, the Fishkill story to add to that is that uh, General Jacoba swore out who was a who he was 89 years old at yeah. the time from his from his home rode horseback to Poughkeepsie and sat 
I think to the immediate left or immediate right of Lafayette at yeah. the at the breakfast that was yeah. held in his honor. Yeah, I think it was uh, was breakfast with the Nelson House. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. That's right. He was the only gentleman, but yeah. yeah. Actually, Joey Joey Cameron's he was instrumental in having signs and say short out though when he walked through 82. And, yes. Oh. Uh, nice. Boeing was still running. There was two signs there that they short out though. Um, Any other questions or comments for Bill? All right. Hearing none, we will look forward to even more <laughs> interesting scholarship plans for 2021 if anyone wants to sign with that. If we could do our bill on. Yeah, we're good. All right, so next on the agenda is Rev 250, which we have been talking about for quite some years now. So just as a very brief reminder, as far as the federal government is concerned, Rev 250 is a one-year celebration in 1986. And nationally, the focus has been on just doing programming in that one year of 2026. The state of New York, however, and the act that it passed in December of 2021, established a full anniversary cycle running from 2024 all the way through 2033 without sort of any discussion or thinking about how to sustain that. Currently, the state's Rev 250 Commission is still not set because the governor's office has failed to appoint at least two people. And now there are rumors that some of the other appointments from the Senate and the Assembly have dropped out or moved away. So there may be yet other vacancies. Until such a time as the Rev 250 Commission sits, no funding can flow through the Rev 250 lines from the federal government and none will be released within a state government. Wipe up and pull from all of it. So there is a great deal of work being done on the state level in terms of advocacy, trying to get the governor's office to appoint the other two people to fill whatever vacancies may exist in the senatorial assembly appointments. But we have no guarantees or timelines of when that will occur. As far as regional work goes, Regions within the state are beginning to form or have already formed their own 501c3s to run the 250 program. The five boroughs have one. North Country now has run that's being run through Fort Ticonderoga. And I am currently leading an effort to organize one here in the Hudson Valley called Revolutionary Hudson Valley. It would take the 10 counties from Columbia and Green South, Rockland and Westchester, Plus Sullivan County, because the southern tier of the Catskills are not forming 501c3 at this point. The sole purpose of Revolutionary Hudson Valley is to act as a funding catchment. So to be there to receive large chunks of money and to figure out a way, probably not through regranting, because a lot of this money coming from government sources, the conditions include no regrant. So the idea is that Revolutionary Hudson Valley would secure large sums of money from outside the region, not competing with anyone inside the region, and then do direct payment for programming being done by local historical societies, museums, or Rev 250 precinct groups. But my suspicion is those pots of money will not become available until March or April of 2026. When Albany panics because they see what Virginia is doing, what Massachusetts is doing, what Pennsylvania is doing, and that's a gubernatorial election. So that effort is underway again. It is not a planning effort per se. The county historians with the representatives for each of the counties, we do talk to each other. So the conversation is there, but we are looking to promote things that are happening grassroots, local level other than coming up with any sort of mandatory plan for the region. According to the state historian, he says that his best hope is that um, the five boroughs in the North Country and the Hudson Valley do something 
rather than having something coherent coming out of Albany in terms of the plan and funding. Now, there is good news on the funding front. It is not coming from Albany. It is, well, at least not from the state government in Albany. It's coming through the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area, which is operated by the Hudson River Valley Green. So as some of you may recall, both of these organizations run grant programs. Hudson River National Heritage Area for years ran the Heritage Development Grant Program, which because it was federal funds had significant reporting requirements. A couple of years before COVID, they started beefing up their event sponsorship program, but that was still relatively small amounts of money $500 here, $250 there. If you could promise a multi-day event with a couple of hundred people attending, you might get $850. As of September, the National Heritage Area would close the Heritage Development Grant because the heritage areas, all of them nationally, are being brought completely inside National Park Service, which is good news because that means the heritage areas will survive. It has been tuck and go since 2010, 2011, when many of these heritage areas were established because they had to make a fresh appeal of justifying their existence for congressional budgets. It wasn't an every year of Congress thing, but usually in three to four year cycle. Now as part of the National Park Service, they have more or less guaranteed funding. They don't have to fight for their lives every other session but the federal grant requirements are now in full force, which means that if they were to run a grant program, anyone applying would have to go through grants.gov, which for those of you who dealt with New York State's grants, well, the federal one is even worse, requires tons of documentation that is generally not on hand. Local historical societies would have to reach back to their founding documents to gather a bunch of information that is not normally requested. So in light of that, the Heritage Area has discontinued the Heritage Development Grant, taken that funding line and applied it completely to event sponsorships and raised the funding level for event sponsorships. So now for a minimum one day event at one site, you can apply for up to $2,000 in sponsorship funds. The maximum award is $10,000 for a multi day, three or more site event. This is all good news because it means that there's money that you don't have to go through a federal grant portal to, mm -hmm. to secure. And a grant portal that you do have to go through has been simplified significantly. I've been helping a couple of organizations in the county with these event sponsorships, including East Fish Hill or partner events. And I can tell you that the old way of doing this was not easy. You had to turn in receipts, you had to have itemized budgets, you had to have all sorts of reporting that is no longer required. It is a two step process where you tell them what you want the money to be used for. And then at the end of it, you provide them with receipts that show it is a reimbursement program. It shows that you have spent the money. And this is open to any history events. They're pretty flexible on type of events. It can be lectures, living history, musical programs. And there is a special bonus for programs that are Rev 250 points because they have a charge from the federal government to support that. So now we actually have a lot of money to draw on that is ready and enthusiastic to support Red 250 programming on the local level. And most of our programs don't require a tremendous amount of money. So Val, to speak to your point earlier, now there is money available. I think this will hopefully help our planning process because I know that my precinct committee has not met because of a lack of uh, a promise of funding. I know many of the other precincts have not met. Mal wins the award for carrying her precinct forward with regular meetings. And the uh, Rombout precinct met, what was that in October? Yes. And Denise Van Buren is now on board as a co chair of the RIC. She has given marching orders to all of the organizations involved. So 
Moving behind up here before we touch up. Yeah. So this is good news because it means that there is money, even though it's not the money that we were promised. Yeah. Is the level of money that I think we can do a lot with on the local level. So I'm working with tourism. There will be heritage tourism initiatives rolling out, which of course are not the most history heavy. I'm working with them to pick up the amount of history included as much as possible. Those will at least generate attention and interest in local history topics for the community. I'm working with Bill to populate the county Red 250 resource sites with a timeline of what's going on in Dutchess County during the revolution since we were sort of the red basket of the revolution in the Hudson Valley being close enough to the fighting, but also far enough away that we could supply but not be threatened by an attack. So that is the broad overview. I suspect that in the next year or so, I will be offering some form of how-to manual on a menu of event types that organizations are looking for ideas because this is something that's being asked for on the national level and no one is provided. We do still have the American Association of State and Local History, A-S-L-H, I got those letters in the right order, it has their five themes booklet, their Red 250 field guide. That is the only national level planning framework that's going to be made available. So at this point, we have any questions, comments, thoughts? I just want to say, it's a topic for New York State. So we have eight years of the reenactment. Uh, since so many things happened here in New York State. I know Brooklyn in 1776, I don't know Montgomery, Brooklyn in 1777, Brooklyn in 1777, it's a first place of quality book from 1683, picture of Major John Andre, the state of West Point, uh, West Virginia, West Point, uh, and Washington's headquarters, 1781 to 1783. Unfortunately, most of that doesn't affect Douglas County, right? But, uh, you know, this case of blood before was a, a big thing. Um, so, and um, and the reason that the scanning was here was more appropriate in the region. So, yeah. Any other questions or comments? Um, Westchester's been doing a great job with all their presentations there. Down to a lot of them. So I'm working on a launchment for Duchess for 250 for June of next year, 2024. It's been a bit of a challenge finding a host city, but I'm pretty close to sealing an agreement with the FDR Library and Museum down in Hyde Park, which will permit us to use the three big multi-use rooms as well as the lawn. We're looking to bring in Brigade of the American Revolution to provide us with reenactors, living history interpreters. And in that space on the inside of the building would be much like our old Hudson Valley History Fair down at Locust Grove, table presentations by local historical societies, museums, history groups, Red 250 planning committees. Or is this on board with that? We've asked for county budget money, which is so far made it through the budget. If the budget vote hasn't happened yet and the legislature is due pretty soon. So things are beginning to move forward. I have a copy of it. All of the people who are doing reenactments or willing to do reenactments um, in the area, do you have a copy of it? I have seen it. People, they are perhaps not the person, so I would put it in the directory. That one is geared towards specifically people who are willing to come into libraries and provide programming. But we are looking at replicating that model on the regional level for Revolutionary Hudson Valley to give a variety of speakers, including professors and accredited scholars who could present to historical society. You've been in contact with the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia? I have. I know Scott's the director. 
A couple of years, a couple of years ago, we were down there for the uh, British takeover. I never knew that the British were there from October 1777 to 1778. Yeah. And I got to talk to one of the guys, and I asked about Major John Arthur. He says, You mean Captain? Arthur? So he's a captain. He said, to the guy that they're now, they know stuff. He said, You mean Captain? Andre. He wasn't a major at that time. <laughs> No further questions. We will move on to the next anniversary cycle. And Peter, I know I haven't prepped you for this, but you know more about this than anyone else who you work with the Underground Railroad Institute. And that is the end of Grand Emancipation. Yeah. Well, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we have been working on. The Nelson Anti-Slavery History Project is uh, one of the early members of this New York State Consortium of uh, Underground Railroad Sites and Programs. Sites and programs uh, have been certified by the National Park Service Network for Freedom. And uh, one of the things that we began to work on about a year and a half ago was looking forward to 2027. Uh, fall within this uh, uh, the, you know, the Rev 250 theater, uh, but what we wanted to do was try to jumpstart some ideas and programming uh, uh, around this issue. And uh, where we are at this point, the individual, uh, some other, other organizations are also beginning to look at 2027. We're doing some work specifically here in, in the in Hudson area. Uh, but what EarthNews is looking for uh, right now is serving as a kind of a, a central information system for uh, state organizations. So uh, in anticipation of this being a pretty substantial uh, period uh, of build up to 2027. So we're looking at, we've been doing some work with the state already and talking about some of this. Uh, and during 2024, we have our next meeting in January, we're going to begin to put some date markers going forward for the next couple of years uh, and begin to publicize uh, broadly across the state uh, the importance of 2027. In terms of content, for us, 2027 is an end, but only a partial end. Because even though slavery was officially abolished in New York State on July the 4th, there were substantial numbers of former enslaved people who faced indentures. indentures. If you look at the language of the actual abolition law, it says that the children of enslaved people uh, born after 1799 will be free in 1827. However, they will owe indentures to their mother's owner for X number of years. Uh, and there was a whole terrible thing about uh, former owners being able to basically pawn off they're the slave children uh, to New York State care. So it's really, it's a really squishy thing. We like to look at 2027 as a great marker, and it is no doubt a great marker for New York State. The reality underneath the celebration is there is still substantial indentured service owned by a lot of formerly enslaved people. And that didn't end until, well, they said 1827 for another 23 years or 22 years. So you're talking almost 1850 before formerly enslaved people, the children of former slaves, were actually come out from under that indentured service. So those are some of the some of the messaging that we want to talk about as well. The celebratory nature of 1827, 
but also the fact that just below the surface, not all enslaved people actually became totally free in 1857. Uh, there's also, in terms of content, there's also another wrinkle here. Uh, officially, the date for New York State was July 4th. As time on, uh, African Americans and their abolition supporters began to ask, well, is that really the right date? Because they began to talk about African Americans, former slaves, saying, that's not our date of freedom. We're going to be celebrating on July the 5th. Because they didn't want to get U.S. celebration of independence mixed up with the enslaved population independence. So there's, there's really fabulous stuff here, really important. And, and Dutchess County and the whole New Hudson Valley was very much involved in this. Uh, so that's some of, some of where this is heading. Peter, could folks reach out to you if they want to collaborate on Sure, that? absolutely. Yeah. I'll circulate your yeah. email address. Is that yeah, do the Gmail. Yeah. PLXB711 at Gmail. Uh, some of this will be, we have uh, applied with the Underground Railroad Education Center in Albany and the African American Heritage Center in Buffalo. We have uh, we're putting together a proposal for next year's New York State History Conference. I don't know if anybody else is applying for that. We have until January 1st. <laughs> it's coming up fast. So some of this is going to be uh, part of that presentation, assuming we can accept it. This, along with the, uh, you know, the Lafayette stuff and the uh, and the other, you know, revolutionary stuff here, and then you look at these next few years is going to just be fabulous. Really great opportunities for education. And in terms of some other stuff, we could get uh, we could get the Oblong meeting perhaps involved with a little demonstration about how the British took over uh, uh, the the meeting house in Poland and to serve as a hospital. And the uh, Quakers moved out because they wouldn't get involved in any kind of fighting activity. So there's a lot of opportunities for uh, know That's really good. Yeah. Not part of 2027. Just I think you know I support great all the work you're doing, and I just my personal interest has been how to educate young people on civics. And Mike Fisher here and I have had yeah. some luck with the Greenback Public School seventh grade civics class. And uh, I would just my own personal interest is to try to build on that yep. and have these big national events, yep. have opportunities to use local names mm -hmm. to educate local students on yep. um, civics, because apparently there's a big gap. Oh yeah. Well, the work that that uh, you know, DCHS has done, Ray Roberts, some of her research, uh, and and the compilation of stories that have been unearthed, we have a tremendous number of local names of African Americans, yeah, formerly enslaved, became leaders yeah. in the abolitionist right. movement. A number, uh, a large number of of white. Uh, Citizens of Dutchess County who became co-leaders with them in the Dutchess County Anti-Slavery Society, yeah. in the Poughkeepsie Anti-Slavery Society. We had the formation of the AME Zion Church. First Congregational Church came out of a, a, a really a, a violent uh, assault on Samuel Gould, uh, who was trying to give a talk, an anti-slavery talk. Uh, so history here during this next several years is really rich. We have tons of stuff. So, yeah. Well done for getting right a couple on. of decades yeah. head start on it. <laughs> and, uh, 
Uh, I wasn't around when Rebecca decided to uh, <laughs> put the program together. Lucky to yeah, it's been around a long time. Yeah, yeah. it helps to improve it. Soother, more than 250 is about so far. You know, right? You say this, but you mentioned the Underground Railroad. When I was in grade school, they thought about the Underground Railroad. Well, I grew up in Queens, New York City, and it was used for the subway. I thought they put the blacks on the subway from South Carolina. <laughs> 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 I think that's true. So the other part of 2027 related. So 1777 is the famous battle of Saratoga. But it is also the one time the British came up the Hudson Valley, a major campaign that you can actually see an artifact of behind you on the table over there. Uh, that is from Henry Livingston's house in Poughkeepsie, sort of around where Locust Grove is today, which was one of many structures hit by British naval gunfire. That they were using everything they could see from their boat as target practice. Okay. There are rumors that they came ashore at various places. I have not looked for all the documentation yet, but they clearly burned Kingston and then burned Claremont. So there are plans, albeit ones that are happening our borders, not within Dutchess County, to make that a big year here in the Hudson Valley. We know that we're going to be up against Saratoga, that the state of New York is putting their weight, whatever that might end up being. Find Saratoga, they've already selected a date. They've got a private site so that they don't have to worry about a national government shutdown, um, pushing it out of the national park. But uh, the battle or the burning of Kingston is going to be a significant event as part of that. That's going to be in October 2027, just like it was in October of 1777. I'm working with the city of Kingston and the county of Ulster to help build up that event. It's going to be held every year now and 2027. What happens after 2027 is a big question mark. But that was the year not only that the British came up, but that the first New York State Constitution was ratified in Kingston, which is a fourth while British part of Kingston, and which basically made Poughkeepsie the de facto state capital because the state is simply a peripatetic. It moved around, but mostly Poughkeepsie, and that laid the groundwork for the United States Constitutional Ratification Convention that happened in Poughkeepsie. In 1788. Okay, so Adam, yeah. powerful, powerful comments about October 1777. So the the cannonball that lodged in there is actually at the George Washington headquarters museum. I don't see it sometimes. I thought we should reunite the two things. And we have a wonderful letter three months prior to October. In his own hand, Henry Livingston was writing to his brother saying it would be madness for the British to try to come up the river. It's not going to happen. Anyway, he got that one. The other thing we have is famously uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, in 1936 with all that was going on. Uh, well, when he became president, asked the British Admiralty to give with all the British ship logs of the story up and the burning, and those were given to the, they were sent to the White House under the seal of the ambassador. And then when we have them, he gave them up after. So we have the documents from the British Admiralty that show the other side of the story. Well, there was a chain across the Hudson yeah. River in 1777 by Fort Montgomery. The British cheated and they unloaded their troops. Uh, down by Bear Mountain, they went up over and came behind down from the mountain and attacked Fort Clinton and Montgomery. And when they won the battle, you know, they just ascended the chain and went to Kingston. Yeah. It is. All right. 
So 2027 will be a big year. And then the last one that's on the radar is 2033. This is going to be especially big for New York City because it's evacuation day. And probably most of you know this, but for those who don't, prior to the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, evacuation day was the big holiday down in New York City. Manhattan is already working on how they are going to hold a massive celebration on par with the early 20th century evacuation day festivities. Like a week before, or I guess it would be before Thanksgiving, because the British, of course, didn't take the future holiday into consideration. <laughs> they did all of their positions in and around the city for the last time in November of 1783. There's all sorts of stuff that will be involved, including the famous episode of the British leaving one of their flags behind a tall flagpole that they greased. In order just to frustrate the attempt. Eventually, stories range from the flagpole being cut down to one specifically intrepid individual managing to defeat the groups and get to the top. That will start to be reenacted. Oh. 2033, however, some Manhattan stuff. Those troops were in Orange County and Duchess County and in Putnam County awaiting the final go order to move down the river to New York City. So there is opportunities to tie in with that. But it's tourism has not yet woken up to this or has Hudson Valley tourism, but I'm sure they will. So that is something just to bear in mind that it's on the radar and it's going to soak up a lot of attention. If we get 2,000 people from Dr. Stone and watch down to New York, it might take a couple of days. <laughs> Volunteer to organize. <laughs> so. Also, evacuation day ended when World War One started because we did it once since we were now partners with England fighting Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't want to upset them, so basically, evacuation day ended this in 1973. All right, so now. Questions or further thoughts on 20 to 20 or 2033? Are there any additional points of business that anyone wants to bring up? Let me just throw something in about 2033, which is the British left with 3,000 former enslaved people. Uh, uh, most have not been to Nova Scotia and some of the other islands up there. It'd be great if we could do some research in determining if we can identify any of those enslaved people who are here in Dutchess County or in Hudson region. There's probably some stuff. Uh, there's a couple of books with the Danes of enslaved people who left with the British, but tying them back specifically to a region. Uh, it's, it's That's it. So they went to Canada with them? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, uh, uh, Dan Jones is, uh, has ancestors who, who left New York, and, and he has ancestors, uh, former relatives, or whatever, up in Nova Scotia. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dan Jones is uh, uh, one of the local African American uh, historians, does a lot of photography on uh, uh, African American graveyards. And he has he has ancestors who fought on both sides of the war, including the slave people, and then some of the ancestors. Wow, and that's a good area. And I think we just heard that there's a book of like three thousand yes. enslaved people that yeah. went and that had their masters' names. Yes. Associated. So we have to yeah we have to tie them back. Yep. Right. So that is a great story yeah. about how the British got them out. Because yes. technically, yeah. the um, part of the peace treaty permitted enslavers to become and British lines to claim their people. So the British changed their evacuation schedule and put these enslaved individuals on the transports for their own consumers. Mm -hmm. And I am working on tracking the Loyalist diaspora. A fancy word for them out of Dutchess County. We've got a couple of different 
projects going on now to turn things like our loyalist sales, our tax uh, receipts, Georgia has worked on some of this stuff in a database is that we can cross reference. I'm also working on loyalists who join Royal Provincial Regiments, the British regiments that weren't red coats. But uh, so their story is going to be involved with that too, because that's how we get a bunch of the work that was done by Clifford or Buck, I think. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Many of them settled at one specific place on Lake Ontario. Yeah. I think it was Adolphus Adolphus Town. Town. Adolphus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and including good old Beverly Robinson, who was about half um, county, who ended up in New Brunswick. So thank you, Peter, for that reminder that we do have a lot of high ends. Yeah, there, yeah. Even if we can't compete, we would reach slag hole. <laughs> but we, we couldn't do a march. We couldn't do a <laughs> march there. We are still on the train. <laughs> Celebrate it. <laughs> so any other thoughts, comments, business to bring before the meeting? No. Yes, sir. Um, I forgot to mention, you could use all the help we can get, so information or anything in a more way, please get me to do that. Just getting, getting started. So, yeah. All right. Well, hearing no additional business, thank you all. Those of you who made the journey in person, please take a look around at all of the wonderful items and resources. Those of you online, I hope you stay well. And uh, that we'll see you in person in the new year. So happy holidays, everyone. You said uh, happy holidays. Two, two things. You said that this is uh, from Henry Livingston's uh, book. Historians now believe that Henry Livingston is the one who wrote was the night before Christmas. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. His son. And the other thing is, December 16th is the 250th anniversary of the Wilson Tea Party. I just read that the Army Navy game is going to be played for the field of New Boston this Saturday. It's the only the second time that it's being played in Massachusetts. Yeah, because of the 250th anniversary of the Army. Thank you, Steve. Here we go. All right, so we are officially adjourned. Thank you all for joining us today.